There we go. I realized I was thirsty just as we were getting started. <laughs> um, so hi, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, those of you who have been here for a while, uh, Sina especially, may have noticed that I'm in the sanctuary today and I'm, you know, I'm typically not because I can't work and listen at the same time. Um, you know, the, I just can only do one thing at a time. But today, what I'm doing is I am starting work on the Kindle version of Out of the Stillness. And that is just formatting. You know, once you have one, once you have the, the paperback done, then you have to go in and reformat it. But what I've discovered is that these little lines that I put here, they're not working well in Kindle. So I'm having to go through and delete every single one of those lines in this book. <laughs> so that's so that's why I'm able to, to listen and work at the same time. It doesn't really require any thought, um, but it's taken a bit of time. So that's that's the project I'm working on now is de deleting all the lines out of the book so I can convert it to Kindle without it looking silly. Um, and then I also am removing page breaks because Kindle breaks pages differently than this size book. And you know, it's all that kind of formatting stuff that I'm doing. So um, I'm able to listen and work at the same time. So it's been nice being here this morning. Uh, but for those of you, some people have told me they're waiting for the Kindle version. For those of you who are waiting for the Kindle version, I would imagine two to three weeks. Um, I'll have it ready. It should be ready before Christmas. Um, I'll let you know when it's done. So uh, last week, um, I was looking at uh, step four. I was looking at desire. And I think I'm ready to look at uh, quote 798 if I marked my book right. Or actually, it was two weeks ago, I think. I don't remember. Yeah, because last week the sanctuary was closed. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So it was two weeks ago. So uh, I'm going to start with quote number 798. I'm going to start uh, with the seven steps to awakening. And this is a quote from Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. It is enough to stop thinking and desiring anything but the Supreme. That's the quote. I, you know, he's usually quite short. <laughs> Not always, but usually. It is enough to stop thinking and desiring anything but the Supreme. So let's have a peek at... Uh, how I contemplated this 798 and out of the stillness. How does one desire truth when truth is unknown to the mind? One does not need to desire truth with the mind. One does not need to imagine and envision, which is mind's way of desiring. One does not need to think about and plan in the way mind does when it desires something it thinks it does not have. There is another way of desiring. One may simply be. One can be present with the coolness or warmth of the air. One can notice the present stillness, love in the heart and rest devotionally there. One may reflect attention on present changeless awareness. These are examples of how to be with one's desire for truth. One may be with this desire always, regardless of current circumstances. There is nothing that can distract away from this desire when one wants out of love to be with it always. So it's funny because, you know, we talk about the spiritual aspiration or true desire. And typically uh, when we desire something, it's because we don't have it. That's, that's typically what the word means. So typically the word desire comes from a sense of lack. 
you know, I might desire, I remember, <laughs> I remember way, way back when I used to work at this company in Waltham, Massachusetts, um, after lunch, I would desire chocolate and I would run around to everybody's office to see who had chocolate. You know, <laughs> it was like, I remember thinking, I am really addicted. I can't think about anything until I get my chocolate. Um, but, you know, there was a sense of lack there that had to be satisfied, right? Uh, if I desire uh, to go on a trip, for example, I might spend lots of time fantasizing about that trip, planning that trip, figuring out exactly where I want to go on that trip. Um, we can't do that with truth. Because the truth is, until we awaken to truth, we don't know what it is. Anything that we would visualize or imagine would be just that, imagination. We can, we can not plan the journey. Whatever journey it is that we need to take, it's going to happen spontaneously. I can't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, right? It's going to happen spontaneously. And there's something egoic. I want to say something wrong, but I wanted to define the word wrong. I want to define it as egoic. There's something wrong about desiring truth with a sense of lack, like it's off. It's not in harmony with the truth itself. So all the ways that the mind knows how to desire, which is all about getting something I don't have, None of those ways work when we're talking about truth. So it's funny because we're using the exact same word, desire, but it's a different kind of desire. We need to learn how to desire. Um, I don't want to say desire with the heart because I think that can still be misunderstood. It's with being. We need to learn how to desire with being. And the way, ah, a little symbol just came to my mind, which I'll use in a moment. The way you desire with being is by being that. You know, the Bible says, imitate God, right? By being that or being with that to the best of my ability all of the time. So the first example that came to my mind, uh, two examples came, hopefully I don't forget them. But the first example that came to my mind was uh, a little a little girl, like about a three or a four year old girl. And, you know, there's something about children. They desire to be adults. It's just that's what they want. They want to be adults. So how do they be adults? They play at being adults. Right. Little girls love to have a little kitchen. Right. A little little pretend vacuum cleaner, maybe a little pretend shopping cart. They desire to be an adult by being an adult, by playing adult by being an adult to the best of their ability, right? They don't plan for being an adult. They don't have a sense of lack about not being an adult, right? None of that's there. They're just being it in their playful way. The other example that came was the example of two lovers. You know, it's fair to say a lovers desire one another, but they, when they desire one another, they be together. Right. They think of each other. They talk when they can or they text when they can. Right. It's a being together. So. The way that we desire truth is by being with truth. Um, to the best of our ability, you know, contemplating something that we you know, read or something that we heard, uh, noticing awareness, staying with this present experience rather than being off in the mind. Just, I mean, there's a, a myriad of ways that we can be with the truth, even when we're really upset, right? We have these ways of being with the truth then, like rest, accept, and trust, or Leo's superconductor practice. So the way that we desire the truth is the same way that a child desires to be an adult or that a lover desires to be with their lover by doing it by being it to the best of our ability. So it's not coming from a sense of lack. In this case, the word desire doesn't mean getting something I don't have. And of course, as seekers, 
we tend to misunderstand that. We think that's what desire means. We think we don't have truth and we have to get what we don't have, right? At some point we realize that's not true, but I think we all probably started there. So this isn't about getting what I don't have. It's about this type of desire is the desire to be it now. I desire to be this now, not that now, right? That's what the word desire really means. And of course, if you've read uh, Adya Shanti's little book, which name, it has the word liberation in the title. I can't remember the name. If somebody wants to type it in, if you know, I'll say it out loud. But in his little book, when he talks about spiritual aspiration, he talks about how a spiritual aspiration is something that you aspire to when? Who can answer that question? Something that you aspire to when? Now. Yeah, and did it. Now. Right. So, so, um, so it's about, it's about being now, practicing now, contemplating now. That's how you desire. So, again, if we look at, um, first of all, let's see what Nizar Gadada said, 798. It is enough to stop thinking and desiring anything but the Supreme. So, we're talking about, well, the way NTI puts it, is the singular thought of God, right? Just always right now and whatever I'm doing, you know, whatever's going on for me, being with it as truth or being with it inner focused or whatever, whatever my best effort is, right? Whatever my best effort is, I'm living my desire now. So again, in seven, in the out of the stillness, seven ninety eight says, "How does one desire truth when truth is unknown to the mind? One does not need to desire truth with the mind. One does not need to imagine and envision, which is mind's way of desiring. One does not need to think about and plan." and the way mind does when it desires something it thinks it does not have. There is another way of desiring. One may simply be. One can be present with the coolness or warmth of the air. One can notice the present stillness love in the heart and rest devotionally there. One may reflect attention on present, changeless awareness. These are examples of how to be with one's desire for truth. One may be with this desire always, regardless of current circumstances. There is nothing that can distract away from this desire when one wants, out of love, to be with it always. Another thing it always reminds me of, and, and, and this is true, I think we've all been in love at some point. I mean, you know, really newly, freshly in love, right? That's what I mean by in love, in love right now. We've all been in love at some point. And when you're in love, new and freshly in love, it's not hard to think about your lover, <laughs> right? I mean, when you, when you probably drive your friends crazy because in conversation, all you want to talk about is your new lover, right? You don't want to talk about anything else. You don't want to think about anything else. You don't want to be with anything else. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first, right? We're not anxious. We've all done that stupid little phone game. You didn't hang up. <laughs> you know, so, but that's desire, right? That's desire. So what this is talking about is that same passion, that same desire for truth where um, whatever I appear to be doing, truth is really there with me in some way, right? Maybe I'm feeling within for what am I to say now? What am I to do now? Maybe I'm just paying attention to awareness while I'm being present with whatever's going on. Maybe I'm practicing the loving all method. Maybe I'm saying a mantra. I mean, who knows? But there's something going on because I desire to be with truth now. And so I am, 
right? And I don't even have to imagine a future, right? It's just being with it now. So let me read this one more time and then, and then we'll go on. How does one desire truth when truth is unknown to the mind? One does not need to desire truth with the mind. One does not need to imagine and envision, which is mind's way of desiring. One does not need to think about and plan in the way mind does when it desires something it thinks it does not have. There is another way of desiring. One may simply be. One can be present with the coolness or warmth of the air. One can notice the present stillness, love in the heart and rest devotionally there. One may reflect attention on present changeless awareness. These are examples of how to be with one's desire for truth. One may be with this desire always, regardless of current circumstances. There is nothing that can distract away from this desire when one wants, out of love, to be with it always. All right, so um, next is 799. And, and I actually have uh, three different things in out of the stillness, 799A, B, and C. <laughs> So let's see what Nizargadatta said, 799. The idea of enlightenment is of utmost importance. Just to know that there is such a possibility changes one's entire outlook. Again, this is Nizargadatta Maharaj. The idea of enlightenment is of the utmost importance. Just to know that there is such a possibility changes one's entire outlook. So first I'm going to look at 799A. When the desire for truth occurs, it is not an accident. It is a gift. It is a calling. It is as if the mysterious force of the universe has exhaled itself into different forms for the sake of tasting experience. And now it is inhaling again, calling itself back to itself for the sake of resting in remembrance. So this reminds me of um, that song in Jesus Christ Superstar, the song in Gethsemane when Jesus is mad at God, because, <laughs> you know, I did this and I did this and now you want me to die. <laughs> you know, he's, all, he's all mad at God. And he says something about, um, Jesus says like when I, something like when I started this, right? When I started this, there was passion. That's not the, the exact words, but that's the idea. When I started this, there was passion, but now I'm tired, you know? But he has this idea when I started this and then suddenly he realizes, wait, I didn't start this. You started this, right? He realizes that even his calling didn't come from him, that he doesn't even have that much uh, personal will, not even to desire truth. And that's true for all of us. If the desire for truth is here, it's because we are being called. We don't get to claim that. We didn't create that. It just showed up one day, right? It just started showing up. Where did it come from? Right? It came from truth, wanting to return to truth. And likewise, I know sometimes, you know, there's a challenge uh, with maybe wanting to judge those who don't feel called. Well, is that their fault? If, if the calling hasn't come to them yet, is that their fault? Aren't they still just out there tasting experience because that's what they're supposed to be doing right now is tasting experience. So that's what this is saying is that the, the desire itself that calls us back is impersonal, right? It's, it's, it's not something that we created. It just showed up, right? So again, 799A, 
When the desire for truth occurs, it is not an accident. It is a gift. It is a calling. It is as if the mysterious force of the universe has exhaled itself into different forms for the sake of tasting experience. And now it is inhaling again, calling itself back to itself for the sake of resting in remembrance. So that was 799A. So that was my first contemplation of the Nizargadatta quote. Let me read the quote again, and then we'll go on to 799B. The idea of enlightenment is of utmost importance. Just to know that there is such a possibility changes one's entire outlook. So 799B. When you feel the call of the inhale, you can change your way of being. On the exhale, you were focused outward, and rightly so, because gaining experience was your God-given purpose. It was the purpose of the exhale. Conversely, when the call of the inhale occurs, you can turn your attention inward. Um, but this speaks to, well, <laughs> I got so many things come to my mind at once. My mouth just can't move that fast. Uh, one of the things that came to my mind was that Rumi poem about being a limp fish, right? God is the fisherman. God casts his rod and he hooks you, right? That's the calling. That's the desire for truth. He hooks you. And then Rumi recommends that instead of being the fish that's fighting why God is pulling you in, because guess what? God's going to pull you in. <laughs> instead of being the fish that's fighting why God is pulling you in, Rumi recommends being the limp fish, right? Just kind of allow yourself to be pulled in. Well, that's what this is saying. This is saying prior to the calling coming, you were totally caught up in the world and, and, and rightly so, because that was your purpose. Experience, tasting experience was your purpose. But now that the calling has come, uh, we can turn our attention inward. It's cooperating with the calling, we usually call that willingness, right? And of course, resistance is still being focused outward and being, you know, being the fighting fish. But just turn our attention inward and we're cooperating uh, with God pulling us back, back in. Um, there's a lot of things that I love. I still love chocolate, you know. Uh, I love. Uh, outside it snowed yesterday and the sun's shining today and the sky is blue and it's just beautiful outside. I just love looking outside, looking out the window. I love, you know, my dog. <laughs> I love, you know, I could just go on and on and on. All these things are going to hit my mind if I sit here long enough, things that I love. I, you know, I love a lot of things. I enjoy life. I'm happy. But the thing that I love most is that quiet time in the morning when I'm alone in contemplation and meditation. Why do you think that is? Why do you think I love that the most? Because that's when I'm in the most harmony. We'll call it with my current purpose. Right? When you're, when you're, in the most harmony with yourself, you feel the best. That's, that's just the effect of being in harmony with yourself. So I love hiking. You know, I love kayaking. Uh, I love sometimes going to a music show. Uh, I love being with my family. Right now I'm loving watching uh, The Crown on Netflix. But what I love the most is that quiet time in the morning. You know, that's when I'm being the limp fish, right? That's when I'm being pulled in. And that's my purpose because I'm caught in the inhale. And so when I'm in harmony with the inhale, I feel the best. And even those words sound pale to me. You know, they don't sound strong enough, but it's the 
the most loved, the most fulfilled, the most satisfied, the most at home, the most myself, right? More than all that other stuff that I love. So 799B, when you feel the call of the inhale, you can change your way of being. It's like you have permission. You know, you have permission to be the limp fish. You have permission to be in harmony with your purpose. You have permission to feel that most love, that most satisfied, that most fulfilled, that most home feeling. You can do it. It's okay because that's your purpose now. You're in the inhale. You're no longer in the exhale. You don't have to be the experience monger anymore, right? You can lean into allowing yourself to be inhaled and love that, right? But just love that. So when you feel the call of the inhale, you can change your way of being. On the exhale, you were focused outward and rightly so because gaining experience was your God-given purpose. It was the purpose of the exhale. Conversely, when the call of the inhale occurs, you can turn your attention inward. And again, that's where that most satisfaction, that most feel-good feeling comes from now. Seven ninety nine C. We're still thinking. Still, this still reminds me of the limp fish from Rumi. Do not try to fight the call of the inhale. You cannot fully resist the nature of God. To attempt to do so is a useless waste of energy and needless delay. Right, and, and you can tell the difference. I know y'all know the difference. I know I'm not the only one. You can tell the difference because when you're resisting the inhale, isn't there some type of an agitation, right? When you're in resistance, isn't there some type of agitation? Just like that wonderful feeling of when you go within, however you do it, contemplation, journaling, meditation, dyads, whatever, right? That wonderful feeling you get from going within is telling you, yes, 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 you know, yes, yes, <laughs> right? That's what it's saying. Yes, right? You're in harmony with your purpose. That agitation when we're resistance is saying, no, 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 <laughs> right? It, 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 it's communicating with you. The feel good, the feel good is telling you that you're in harmony with yourself. The agitation is telling you that you're not. You're not in alignment with yourself. That's what it's saying, right? You're not in alignment with yourself. So again, why do that to ourselves, right? Why not trust that wonderful feel good of being in harmony instead of torturing ourselves with the agitation of being out of harmony? So do not try to fight the call of the inhale. You cannot fully resist the nature of God. To attempt to do so is a useless waste of energy and needless delay. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting you know, to ask myself, if I know what I love and I know how good it feels, why do I resist it? You know, why not just go with what I know that I love? Why not just be that limp fish that Rumi speaks of? The next one that I have marked is a 801. There's an 801A and an 801B, and I only marked 801B. So let's read 801. Uh, from the seven steps to awakening. And then we'll look at 801B from my journal. 801, Nizargadatta Maharaj. 
whatever name you give it, will or steady purpose or one pointedness of the mind, you come back to earnestness, sincerity, and honesty. When you are in dead earnest, you bend every incident, every second of your life to your purpose. You do not waste time and energy on other things. You are totally dedicated. Call it will or love or plain honesty. Um, and this is something that I've always understood, always meaning since starting the spiritual path in 2004, April of 2004, always starts then, not before. <laughs> um, but when I felt the calling of the inhale, when I felt that calling, and this is even before the Disney cruise, but only in the two or three weeks before the Disney cruise, right? When I felt the calling of that inhale, What I felt to do was start reading A Course in Miracles. And I had tried reading it many years before and didn't understand most of what I read and thought it was too much of a commitment. I had other things to do. I was still pretty outward focused. When I felt the call of the inhale in April of 2004, I remembered that blue book in the nightstand next to the bed and I opened it up, got it out. For, I got it out. And I remembered my prior experience with it, which wasn't the best. You know, and I look at the text and, and I don't remember now and I don't have my course with me, but I think it's like 600 and something pages long. It's huge. I looked at the workbook, which is 365 lessons, huge commitment. And I looked at the manual for teachers, which is this little bitty book. <laughs> and I thought, I'll start there, right? I'll start there. Like I'm feeling the calling, but I'm going to start with the little book. <laughs> and um I don't have any courses here. I have my Kindle though, so I can find it on my Kindle. Shauna gave me a, an extra course, so I'd have one in each location, but I haven't, I haven't done that yet. I need to get one here. Let's see, manual for teachers. See if it will take me right there. Even though I'm writing a Kindle book, the Kindle isn't my favorite thing. Huh. Come on. Yay. Okay. <laughs> I get, I did it. All right. So uh, I'm going to read to you the first thing I read when the calling of the inhale came to me. Okay. So keep this in mind. This is, you know, I, I'm starting to feel the calling. I remember that book. I get it. I decide not to read the two big parts. I'm going to start with this little bitty part because I don't want to be that committed. Right. And listen to the first thing I read. The role of teaching and learning is actually reversed in the thinking of the world. The reversal is characteristic. It seems as if the teacher and learner are separated, the teacher giving something to the learner rather than to himself. Further, the act of teaching is regarded as a special activity in which one engages only a relatively small portion of one's time, like an hour a week in the sanctuary, right? So this is this is all a mistake. It's a mistake that, you know, one person teaches another. It's a mistake that teaching is when you show up in the sanctuary for an hour a week. That's all wrong is what this says. The course, on the other hand, emphasizes that to teach is to learn so that teacher and learner are the same, right? We all know this. The one you teach is yourself. To teach is to learn so that teacher and learner are the same. Now listen to this next sentence. It also emphasizes that teaching is a constant process. It goes on every moment of the day and continues into sleeping thoughts as well. I'm now what? A minute and a half onto the spiritual path, right? I just picked up this book. I started reading it. I've been on the spiritual path for a minute and a half. And this is the sentence I read. Teaching is a constant process. It goes on every moment of the day 
and continues into sleeping thoughts as well. I understood that sentence immediately, probably because I was in the inhale. I understood that my entire life now was going to be my classroom. I didn't understand anything else. I hadn't gotten any further yet in the course, right? I didn't, but I understood that. So that has always been with me. It's like the first lesson I learned. And if you all listen to the early teachings on YouTube or participate in the early insights, you hear the stories of how I used my entire life, no matter what happened, right? I didn't forget to use it for the purpose of awakening. It's the first thing I learned, a minute and a half on the spiritual path. So this is what Nizargadatta is saying here in 801. Whatever name you give it, will or steady purpose or one-pointedness of the mind, you come back to earnestness, sincerity, honesty. When you are in dead earnest, you bend every incident, every second of your life to purpose, right? It's all about the inhale now. That's the purpose of everything. It's all about the inhale. You do not waste time and energy on other things. It doesn't mean that other things aren't happening in your life because we know they are. But it's not about the other things. The other things are about the inhale. You see the difference? We're not going out anymore. We're coming back. You are totally dedicated. Call it will or love or plain honesty. And of course, desire is a word we've been using. You could call it desire, right? So let's see what I wrote in 801B. The question has arisen. It means it showed up in, up here in my mind. <laughs> this, is where, this is where it has arisen. The question has arisen. What if there are no benefits from spiritual practice? What if one spends all their time in meditation and contemplation and nothing ever comes of it? Have you guys had that question arise up here in your minds? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I say, meaning the heart, but I say, does some future benefit need to be derived from the moments that I spend in silent bliss, holding and being held by my love? No, these moments are their own fulfillment. They are their own reward. What is this imaginary reward you seek? Be in love now. It is here now. Your reward is already upon you. Rejoice in it. Now, of course, when I started the spiritual path, you know, I had all that same crap everybody else has going on. The I am bad belief, the I am not safe, I got to take care of myself belief, and uh, the truth is not true belief, right? The world is what's true, right? Not the truth. And uh, although they were all hard on me, all three of those beliefs really caused some trouble. <laughs> they were all hard on me. I think the one that, believe it or not, was the hardest was the truth is not true. Because whenever that would, would show up, how can, I, how can I explain it? It was like a, it was a panic. It was, um, it, this is the thought. I have thrown all of my eggs in one basket now, right? You know, I left my job. I'm following this inner voice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If there's no truth, right? I mean, there's the panic. I don't feel it anymore, but, you know, what have I done? You know, what, what kind of a fool am I? What, you know, it's just, ah, it's just like, it, it had me by the throat, you know, like ah, 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 it, it was, it was, it was the, the toughest one when I felt it, the most fearful one when I felt it. So one of the questions I had to ask myself long before this journal, uh, 
you know, if I, if I started the spiritual path in April of 2004, I probably asked this question in my previous journal in uh, February or March of 2005. I was still in Massachusetts. I hadn't even left yet. The question was, what if the truth isn't true? You know, what if that's the truth? What if the world is real and that's all that's real? I had to ask myself that question because I didn't know that the truth was true yet. I had a faith, I had a trust, but I certainly didn't know it. And when I asked myself that question, what, what came, what came up for me was already, I was only nine months in now. Of course, we saw I had, I had a benefit a month, a minute and a half in. <laughs> so you can imagine nine months in, there was more benefit. <laughs> Nine months in now, I, I look at it and I could see that my experience of the world was already improving. I had already let go of self-hatred by that point. Not the I am bad belief, but that particular flavor of the I am bad belief, self-hatred. I'd already let go of self-hatred. I was already enjoying the morning contemplation time. I was doing a Course in Miracles workbook for students, but you know, I love that morning time. I was already questioning my thoughts and letting go of grievances. Nine months in, I was already benefiting. And so here's the decision I made. Even if it's not true, even if the world is all there is, this is a better way of living in the world. That's the answer I came up with. Right? Yeah, I see you guys agreeing. So that enabled me to move forward because I didn't know the truth was true, but I could see the benefit that was already occurring of putting my faith there. So I decided to go with it, not because I knew it was true, not because I knew I would be enlightened, certainly not because I knew what enlightenment was, just because of the current benefit that I was already experiencing. And that's really what this says. That's what this journal entry is about, 801B. You know, it's the same kind of question arising. At this point, I think the question arose regarding meditation. The practice that I've always resisted the most is meditation. And so, you know, here I am meditating. What if I'm just wasting, you know, an hour, two hours a day? You know, this is the way it comes up. Nothing ever comes of this. I'm just sitting here with my eyes closed. Nothing ever happens. <laughs> I could be doing something else, right? So this is the form of the question uh, when it's in this journal. So the question has arisen, what if there are no benefits from spiritual practice? What if one spends all their time in meditation and contemplation and nothing ever comes of it? But I sit, meaning again, the heart. Does some future benefit needed to be, be derived from the moments that I spend and silent bliss holding and being held by my love? No, these moments are their own fulfillment. They are their own reward. What is this imaginary reward you seek? Be in love now. It is here now. Your reward is already upon you. Rejoice in it. And it is a funny thing, you know, um, I still resist meditation every day, every day. Um, there's always this thought I don't want to do it <laughs> but when I begin however I begin I have different ways of tricking myself into it when I begin and I close my eyes and I don't know five ten minutes in I don't really know how long it starts to feel good you know, it's that feel good again. It's that I'm in harmony with myself again. And as it starts to feel good, I start to drop deeper into the feel good, which is the silence, right? Deeper into just the being. And it starts, you know, and, and, and I get lost in the feel good. And at this point, I still have to set an alarm. I still have to do something every day. Every day when the alarm goes off, I wish I had more time. Isn't that interesting? You know, like the thought is I don't want to do it, but once I start doing it, 
I don't want to do anything else. Isn't that interesting? So that's what this is saying. This is saying, recognize it as its own reward. Recognize that you love meditation. You know, recognize that you love contemplation. I mean, why do I at night now, you know, at eight o'clock when I'm ready to settle down and start getting sleepy, why do I turn on the crown? Well, because I am enjoying the crown. I like it. I'm not watching the crown to get something. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just doing it because I like it. That's what this is saying. So contemplate because you know you like it. Meditate because you know you like it, right? You don't have to get anything out of it. I mean, if you have a glass of wine at night or a beer at night or you smoke a joint at night, why do you do it? Because you like it, maybe, I hope. Hope it's not a, a, some other desperation. If you go for a walk, if you take a nap, uh-oh, my dog, I said the W-A-L-K word, and boy, she just started looking at me. <laughs> if you go for a W-A-L-K, <laughs> or if you take a nap, or if you eat ice cream, why do you do it? Because you like it, hopefully, not out of guilt or something else. Um, so why is this any different? Why is meditation or contemplation any different? You know, we're, we're in the inhale, we're being called. And so what feels really good is when we're in harmony with ourself. So why aren't we just being in harmony with ourself just for the sake of how much we love it and forget about gaining anything? You know, that's what this is saying. Just do it because it's what I love. Just do it because it's what I feel called to do. Forget about getting anything from it. So one more time. The question has arisen. What if there are no benefits from spiritual practice? What if one spends all their time in meditation and contemplation and nothing ever comes of it? But I say, does some future benefit need to be derived from the moments that I spend in silent bliss? holding and being held by my love? No, these moments are their own fulfillment. They are their own reward. What is this imaginary reward you seek? Be in love now. It is here, now. Your reward is already upon you. Rejoice in it. Now, remember that the, the subject we're studying right now is desire, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're looking at in step four. Step four is all about the desire for truth. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not lack. It's not trying to get something we don't have. It's being with what we love, recognizing what we love and being with it. That's how we practice desire, right? It's following our own bliss, as the saying goes, but we have to be smart enough to realize what our bliss is. We have to be smart enough to recognize, ah, I love this, and, and, and the agitation of resisting it, and realize what those feelings are telling us. I was reading something in my journal this morning I think it was in step seven because the book that I read now in the morning when I'm getting myself in the mood you know like you play mood music for sex you know you gotta do something mood too <laughs> for spiritual practice so the, the book that I that I read in the morning to get myself in the mood is this book this is still the book that I'm with right so I was reading it this morning and I was reading uh step seven um and I don't know exactly where I was reading. I'm kind of flipping to see if I can find it. But the idea that I read, which really stood out for me, was what the ego really wants to do is get you to skip. Oh, here it is. I found it. It's 1534. If anybody wants to jump back there with me. 1534. This really, really is brilliant. I'm not complimenting myself, you know, <laughs> it is brilliant. <laughs> Listen to this delay 
is the ego's primary defense mechanism. If you put off seeking self, resting in self, and abiding as self for another day, the ego wins the day. I'm going to read that sentence again. This is number 1534. Delay is the ego's primary defense mechanism. If you put off seeking self, resting in self, and abiding as self for another day, the ego wins the day. Ego's goal is to win day after day, repeatedly, until your body dies. The ego's victory is achieved when you die while attention's outward addiction remains firmly in place. That just jumped out at me today, right? Every single day that you know we listen to that resistance and we believe that's what we want. We're not noticing the agitation and we, and we skip it again and we skip it again. Ego's getting little victories. And, and, and it just wants those little victories to add up until you die, right? That's all it wants. Delay is the ego's primary defense mechanism. If you put off seeking self, resting in self, and abiding as self for another day, the ego wins the day. Ego's goal is to win day after day, repeatedly until your body dies. The ego's victory is achieved when you die while attention's outward addiction remains firmly in place. That's something to think about, isn't it? So um, the next one that I have a mark by is 803A. So let's see if we can look at it in the six minutes that we have remaining. Remaining. So 803. Yeah. Oops. Oh, I yes, have a I, question. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned resting. You said seeking, resting, and abiding as self. Yeah. Is there a distinction between resting and abiding? Because in my mind, I feel that's the same. Yeah, it, it can be the same. In Regina's journal, it, it, resting meant meditating and abiding means when you get up and walk away, still staying there. But, you know, it didn't have to, those words don't have to always mean that, but that is what that meant in that sentence. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're looking at, what did I say we were going to do? 803? 803, 803, Nizar Gadada Maharaj. The desire to find the self will be surely fulfilled provided you want nothing else. But you must be honest with yourself and really want nothing else. If in the meantime, you want many other things and are engaged in their pursuit, your main purpose may be delayed until you grow wiser <laughs> and cease being torn between contradictory urges. Go within without swerving, without ever looking outward. So let's see what I have here in my journal at 803A. What is this moment for? It is for being with my love in whatever way I know to be with it. There is a nagging voice that tells me I do not know how to be with my love well enough. And because I do not know how to be with my love well enough, I am missing it completely. But if I begin to turn my attention toward that voice, that is when I feel lost. When I stay with this innocent, precious moment, writing if I feel to write, looking outside at a bird or a rabbit or a plant if I feel to look, sitting quietly with the heart if I feel to just be. When I do any of these things, I do not feel lost. I feel presently in love. I cannot say at a mental level that I know anything about what is right or what is wrong. 
but I do know the feeling of bliss, the feeling of connection, the feeling of overwhelming presence in all things. This is my present moment joy. This is how I feel called to be with my love. You know, sometimes in my quiet morning time, you know, obviously I contemplate and obviously I meditate, but sometimes I just sit and look out the window. And, you know, the ego will start getting in the, the mind saying, you know, you're wasting time. You're supposed to be meditating right now. That alarm's going to go off, right? <laughs> but what this is saying is trust the feeling. If I'm sitting there looking out the window and I'm feeling that feeling that I know is my God feeling, right? The one I feel when I meditate, the one I feel when I contemplate. If I'm feeling that while looking out the window, then I'm supposed to be looking out the window right then. I'm supposed to be just sitting and being and looking out the window. Now, there could be another day when what I'm supposed to be doing, meaning the calling, what I'm supposed to be doing is meditating and I'm wasting time looking at the window and that feeling of agitation is there. That's different, right? But what this is saying is trust that feeling, that God feeling, right? That connection, that home, that right here, right? Trust that feeling. And then do whatever you're feeling guided to do with that feeling there telling you this is the right thing to do right now. You know, we make these rules in our head and then we try to follow these rules and that feeling isn't always there. That feeling is telling us when we're in harmony. That's the point. That's the point. That's the point. It's not our head that tells us when we're in harmony. It's not those learned rules that tells us when we're in harmony. It's that God feeling, and we all know it. So if the God feeling has me looking out the window, that's perfect. If the God feeling has me reading, contemplating, that's perfect. If it has me meditating, that's perfect. You know, there have been days when the God feeling had me listening to the same song over and over and over again, how many of y'all been there, right? So what this particular journal entry is saying is don't forget what your guide is. Your guide is not the mind. Your guide is not those learned rules. Your guide is not what other people tell you you should be doing. Your guide is that God feeling. That's where God is. That's what the inhale is. That's what's calling you home. So feel for that and do what that is telling you to do and forget the damn rules. Right? That right feeling is telling you that you're right. Oops, can I read it one more time, Sina? Okay, one more time and then we'll quit. So we're out of time. What is this moment for? is for being with my love in whatever way I know to be with it. There is a nagging voice that tells me I do not know how to be with my love well enough. And because I do not know how to be with my love well enough, I am missing it completely. But if I begin to turn my attention toward that voice, that's when I feel lost. When I stay with this innocent, precious moment, Writing, if I feel to write. Looking outside at a bird or a rabbit or a plant, if I feel to look. Sitting quietly with the heart, if I feel to just be. When I do any of these things, I do not feel lost. I feel presently in love. I cannot say at a mental level that I know anything about what is right or what is wrong but I do know the feeling of bliss, the feeling of connection, the feeling of overwhelming presence in all things. This is my present moment joy. This is how I feel to be called with my love or called to be with my love. This is how I feel called to be with my love. So that's that. 
And uh, I won't be here next week. Helen Hamilton will be. So I will be back in two weeks. Thanks you all for hanging out with me. For me anyway, this was great. <laughs> See you later. Bye.